Welcome to the InfoMullet YouTube channel. If you enjoy this content, please like or share. And if you'd like to support the InfoMullet by becoming a mulleteer, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate your support. Um, you know, when we started this in March, we listed the five pandemic responses, and that was the People's War version that was done by China, the pandemic panopticon that was South Korea and Japan and Singapore. We had business as usual, which really no one did for very long. We had mobilization and lockdown, which I now call the hammer and the dance. And then we had induced herd immunity. And we're at the point now where we can compare um, some of these responses and begin to see with a little bit of fullness how they performed. And I wanted to go ahead and do that. What I've done is I've selected four representative countries um, and compared them to the United States or three representative responses and compared them to the United States. So this chart, what it shows is um, Germany, Sweden, South Korea, and the United States. And each of these countries sort of took a different response. And it's just to, again, clear the chart. On the left side, these are actually daily new cases per 100,000 people as a seven-day moving average. That's quite a mouthful. But if you think about it, what it's doing is showing dynamically over time um, how many new cases were each day per 100,000 people, which is a key measure. But it's smooth on a seven-day average, so it's not as jerky, and, and that's okay because it's a long duration of, of time we're looking at. And the four countries represent these different pandemic responses. So in green is what I call the hammer and the dance, which is the mobilization and lockdown. And this is Germany. And I like using Germany because they're over 150,000 cases. It's not like they missed the outbreak or only had a few thousand cases. So it's a really good comparison of a large, complex, regionally diverse uh, sort of Western nation with similar privacy laws that we have uh, here in the U.S. Because the pandemic panopticon, which is in Brown, South Korea, this is obviously, they only had 11,000 cases. They never really had a major outbreak. And, and one could argue that part of that is that their response was so successful, they contained it. But part of the pandemic panopticon is that it does have aspects of it, which would be very hard to get through sort of a European or North American privacy laws. Um, the other one I've picked here is induced herd immunity, which remains a darling of uh, certain crowds that, hey, we can do induced herd immunity. And Sweden's the, really the only country that's still doing that. Netherlands, Belgium, Britain, and a few others tried it but abandoned it. And the last one, um, I kind of jokingly called it thoughts and prayers in the United States. Technically, we're following a hammer and dance approach, which is similar to Germany. But because of the lack of a national strategy or coordination, every state is kind of doing their own thing. And so we can compare now, again, these are somewhat representative of the four pandemic responses. And we can look, all of these are time adjusted. So it all begins, day one is the first confirmed case of that country. So even though these outbreaks happened at different calendar times, so for example, um, Germany actually happened a little bit later than the United States, but we've time shifted it so that we can compare as a life cycle. And what you can see here is that obviously the pandemic panopticon is the most successful of all of them. They never had a major outbreak. They've only had 11,000 cases in South Korea, and they've been able to contain these daily new cases extremely well and, and perform very well. Germany had an outbreak. Like I said, they've had over 150,000 cases, but you can see here they peaked because they went into lockdown. They put the hammer in. They built up their contact tracing, uh, their uh, testing capability. They put in place procedures and they opened into the dance phase and the dance phase and they've been open. And you can see here, the reason why they're able to open is their actual daily new cases remain low. That's why they're able to open. They've done the work to enter the dance phase. They've reopened their economy and they're keeping it very low. So these two, Germany and South Korea, are sort of examples of what right looks like. This is what you want to see. This is what a successful response would look like. Sweden is um, kind of an oddball because they're the only ones doing induced herd immunity. So their intent is to keep it open. And in some ways, getting infections is the point. Uh, you know, their, their goal is to create a herd immunity response in the quote unquote healthy younger population while protecting the elderly. So, you know, a pure case count isn't useful for evaluating because this is what you'd expect to see. You'd expect to see a high continuing daily total of cases as it goes through the population. Uh, the U.S. has not performed well at all. We've been probably, it's not just that we have 1.5 million cases, but by putting this in a per capita, we can do a relative comparison. And even on a relative scale, we're worse than all these other ones and still higher. If you think about this, we are reopening now 
at a higher point of daily new cases than Germany's peak. Germany reopened down here at less than two daily cases or two cases per 100,000 a day. We're reopening right now at around 6.5. And we're, you know, we get about 20,000 new cases a day. So we're still churning through massive numbers of this outbreak. Um, the other way to look at this in comparing responses is at the deaths per 100,000 people. So this is now, the first one was cases, and not everyone will die from it, but this is deaths per 100,000. And again, on the left, we have the per capita level, and then we have the same colors for the same responses. And again, this chart now gives some more context. It's not just cases, but deaths. And so again, South Korea has performed very well. By the way, this is not um, per day. This is accumulated over time. So this is the total deaths per 100,000 as opposed to the daily new deaths. South Korea has performed the best of everyone, but again, they only had 11,000 cases. Germany, again, they had a major outbreak, but they've kept their death per capita at under 10. And you can see it's beginning to flatten out here. It'll still accumulate because people will still die from it, but they've kept it at a low level and they're using the hammer and the dance. Sweden, this is where I think, you know, you can say that induced herd immunity, the goal is to get people exposed, but it's killing a lot of people in doing it. And that's not the goal. The entire goal of induced herd immunity is you're going to protect the vulnerable and the people who are young aren't at risk. Well, if that's the case, their death rate is so far above everyone else, it's not even comparable. And, you know, Germany's right across the Baltic Sea from Sweden. It's probably not a great comparison, but I put up a chart before. Even if you compare Sweden to its neighbors in Norway, Finley, Finland, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, they're at 10 to 12 times the death rate. So induced herd immunity, you know, people make the argument that hypothetically in the future, this will all pan out because Sweden will have a protected population um, who has been infected and been exposed and they'll be better protected from wave two. Well, Germany's open. You know, if induced herd immunity is a real thing and people gain immunity, which we don't know yet, Germany is gaining it. They're, they're back open, they're being exposed and they haven't bought that at the cost of a high death rate. So again, I really think induced herd immunity doesn't have a really strong premise. And you see here that the US approach of sort of a thoughts and prayers is right in the middle of this and not, not a good response at all. We obviously have more deaths in total than any other country by a large degree. Um, I think over 90,000, but per capita, we're not the highest, but we're definitely in the top 10 to 15 worst countries in the world um, per capita. So uh, that's the sort of the, the, it's pretty clear from this that when you look at the responses, we can't do the people's war. We can't use what China sort of draconian violation of civil liberties were. I doubt we could use the pandemic panopticon, but I've been making this pitch for hammer and dance. And I think Germany shows that it can be successful and it can use it very well, but you've got to follow it correctly. The U.S. has just kind of done this scattershot approach and it shows we still have an outbreak. We're reopening in the midst of the outbreak and we've had a lot more deaths per capita um, than I think we needed to. So let me pause here and um, catch up with everyone who's joined. Yeah, Jennifer was mentioning the UK news tells us that we can't compare to countries. Yeah, I, I, I sometimes pick comparisons that are regionally valid, like Sweden, Norway, and Finland are all demographically the same, socially similar. Their political economies are similar. You could argue that Sweden and um, Germany are not a fair comparison, but in this case, we're looking at pandemic responses, and I've done what I have can to normalize. Barbara, good to see you. David? Um, Yes, David Merriam asked, did Australia and New Zealand do the hammer and dance methods? Yes, they were hammering the dance. They did a lockdown very early. They are now opening up because they've built up their... Most countries that have gotten past this are doing versions of the hammer and the dance. Glad, glad that it's helpful. Let's catch up here. Jennifer, Elisa... Yeah, and Mikhail points out there's a lot of assumptions in induced herd immunity. One, the virus doesn't mutate. Two, that we get immunity to begin with. Three, the immunity lasts for more than a couple months. You know, there's so many assumptions that we don't know in induced herd immunity that it seems very uh, dangerous to follow that. Rory, good to see you. James, good to see you. Eugene. Um, yeah, there was a, a question there. I don't know how to pronounce that because your name's in Hebrew, uh, Hebrew but you, you explain why after up in Germany, there's no uptick in cases. So um, that's because Germany has is very strong 
remember, when you open up for the dance, it's not just like, hey, we're open, everyone have fun. You have in place the very capabilities that let you see where the virus is. Remember, in the hammer, the reason you go into lockdown is the virus is invisible. It's spreading through your population and you can't see it. But as you build up that testing capability and the contact tracing capability, so when you find someone, you can see who they're touching, you're able to now see the virus spread. And that way you can identify the people who are infected and isolate them. So in Germany right now, if you're identified as positive, you get quarantined. They don't have to quarantine the entire country anymore, or the province. They quarantine the person who's infected and they make it so that other people don't get exposed to them. They can only do that because they put in place the effort to get up to um, testing capability and contact tracing. And we described last week, there was a situation where Germany thought they'd have to go back into lockdown. They measure it very closely. If they go above R1 replication factor, they're going back into lockdown. And there were a couple of days they were there, but it didn't hit their seven day moving average. So think of Germany, don't think of the dance as just a casual approach. It's a very disciplined, methodical, almost engineered effort to contain cases. They're still gonna have them, people will still get sick, but what they're trying to do is prevent that outbreak upsurge. Um, Sean, good to see you. And let's go, so the next thing is I wanted to review uh, some forecasts we made back in um, March. So for those who have been following for a while, we actually, uh, thanks for watching the video, hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to follow the InfoMullet, visit us on Facebook or Twitter. And if you'd like notifications when we post new video content, click on the red subscribe button below the video. If you've ever wanted to become a mulleteer and support the InfoMullet, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate the support.